Let me put it this way. Maybe I'd podcast with you if you were the last man on Earth, but we're not on Earth. Burn. Because you see, the, the phrase is usually... They're on Mars! Exactly. Yes. So the whole last man on Earth thing doesn't really apply here because the planet they are on is Mars. And the wrinkle is that also on this planet with them are ghosts. Ghosts! Also a matriarchal society, Griffin. Uh, I th- I think this movie rips. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. I, I support you. I don't know if that's a contrarian opinion. Well, I will say that I think this movie is a lot of fun. I think it's um, a lot of fun. That's all I mean by the fact that it rips. I think it's a lot I of think, fun. I think that w- it would be a very contrarian opinion 20 years ago, but it, I did, I, it does seem this movie has a bit of a, a cult happening following now. Uh, but thanks for throwing down your marker. But do you want to introduce the show and our guests and all that first? Sure. sure. No, look, I'm, bl- no, I'm sure. blazing hey. into it because I'm eager to talk about this movie. On this podcast called Blank Check with Griffin and David, I'm Griffin. I'm David. You, you were a little slow that time. You've gotten wow. fast, and that time you were a little bit slow. It's okay. a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their career and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear, and sometimes they bounce on Mars, baby. Sometimes they take that train to Mars. Gotta take that train to Mars, that midnight train to Mars. (laughs) Choo-choo. Choo-choo, more like boo-boo with these ghosts on Mars. I don't know. That's a a fair point. And our our guests can weigh in at any time on any any of this goal. Feel free to weigh in on any of this absolute goal. I was hoping to get a proper introduction. but You You will, you will, you You will. will. We just like the guests to burst in. Then I'm gonna shut my mouth and I'm gonna wait. No, 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 because here's the twist, Dave. wait my turn. Here's the twist. We yeah. like giving proper introductions after people have spoken. So now you can be introduced. Oh, thank God. Okay. I don't have to wait anymore. I'm an impatient guy. This is a mini series on the films of John Carpenter. It's called They Podcast. Today we're talking Ghosts of Mars. And with us are the hosts of the Polygon podcast, Galaxy Brains. One of them is Dave Schilling. Mm hmm. The other Who's one the hasn't other spoken yet, so I can't introduce him. Say something, boo, Jonah. Boo. Jesus. Chicka, 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 boo, boo. I love that joke. I'm going to I'm gonna say that from now on. <laughs> it's good. Jonah Ray is the other guest. Thank you guys both for being here. Thank, Thank you for hosts. having us. I'm going to be the contrarian today, I bet, and I'm going to say I don't like this movie. I think that's the popular opinion. I, I think that's the I don't think it is anymore. Opinion. No, I, I think the people who really care, who really locked in to the Carpenter canon are like, oh, this is one of his misunderstood masterpieces. And I'm, I'm going to say, no, thank you. I, I will say, I think, first of all, he has so many misunderstood masterpieces that on the list of misunderstood masterpieces, even the people who defend this one put it at the bottom, where you're like, sure. this is his 10th most misunderstood film, and I <laughs> struggle to even call it a masterpiece. But we're we're of the generation. Our ages are, I think, sure. all kind of on the similar side. We were around when this came. We were aware of him when it came out. Absolutely. Um, and I think uh, it's, uh, so for us, it's just like, it's like, it's like no, it's not. It's, it's not very good. But then uh, I'm sure there was fans of his that saw Big Trouble Little China and then maybe then pick up on it. If you read reviews of Big Trouble Little China, they they say very many of the same things that they said about Ghosts of Mars. That's the thing. I mean, we've been doing all of these movies in chronological order. We've been spending months living in, in Carpenter Valley. And uh, our listeners have been doing the same, and some of them go ahead of us. And I've been seeing people on our like Reddit and such saying, like, I finally watched Ghost of Mars. I was ready to like this one. Even I can't go with this. <laughs> like, uh... I still think people go, like, this is a breaking point. This is just too fucking silly. And I certainly remember when it came out, and I understood John Carpenter must be somebody because his name is at the top of the fucking title. But I probably hadn't seen any of his movies at the time. It it was just the, the commonly accepted line was this movie is fucking stupid bullshit. Like everyone was <laughs> clowning on this fucking movie. And I For think a good it's, reason. I think it's gained a little bit of a defense since then. But I still think most people, even most Carpenter fans are like, that's when the guy lost his touch. I was surprised. Well, I mean, that it I was vampires it for me, but, uh, <laughs> sure. which I think see Dave just fucks hard. David- I think, I think it slaps and I think it's got some great gore and stuff like that. I think here, my take on the, uh, on ghost of Mars, not being yep. good is because, uh, there was a lot, it was a large budget. It was of its time. Uh, and I, th- and I think the, um, the acting, 
I think the 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 casting on it was it was terrible. I think it, it, it shouldn't have been that. I'm glad you brought up the high budget, the the large budget for this movie, uh, because it looks like a Sci-Fi Channel original movie directed by somebody's second cousin. I'm sorry, but this is a terrible yes. looking movie. Look yes. at it like a look at it like a Doctor Who episode. If this was a Doctor Who yeah. episode, it would be legendary. It's like a Star Trek, uh, you know, episode. They go down the planet, there are ghosts, and then they got to figure it out. It, it just looks like a rust colored tumor. And I can't stand. But everyone is using CGI. Everyone's using CGI at this time. You know, this, this time of this you know, was uh, two like, years after the Matrix. Yeah, two years after the Matrix, and it looks like it came out a decade before the Matrix. And he refused. He was. He wanted to have it tactile. He wanted to have practical effects. He wanted models and miniatures. <laughs> and that is like he wanted a good it all swing. to be shot at night with no stars in the sky. Where it looks like they're inside of a warehouse, that's what he chose to do. You're not gonna see any stars on Mars. Is there's too dusty in the air? How dare you think? <laughs> it was You've been in Los pure, Angeles. It was pure black. It's pure black. Yeah, blackness. there's a lot of dust on that planet. Let's it look just of like the it looked just like the second act motorcycle chase in Escape from L.A. That's what it looks like. I, I keep forgetting which one has the the bike that pops a wheelie in it, and it's Escape from L.A. because it looks like the same set. There's just weird fires everywhere for no reason. What's going on in this movie? Well, do you guys know, I assume you might, that this movie was intended to be the third Snake Plissken film. Exactly. This is a lie. No, it wasn't. This is a lie. No, this it wasn't. It wasn't? I looked it up all last night. What? This I spent is hours Googling this, a, David. A common misconception and yep. is not true. It was not intended to be a sequel to Escape from New York, nor... Was it reworked from the screenplay titled Escape from Earth? For some reason, this has become a, whatever, Wikipedia level fact mm -hmm. that is not true. Oh, it's because, you uh, know why? You know why? It's because there's all these articles that come out that state it as fact because the people who write them don't do any fact checking. They're just like, oh, I saw it in the, these five articles in The Guardian and on something awful or whatever. And they just, it's, okay, that's true. But it's been denied publicly. As JJ puts it in our dossier, what seems to have happened is Carpenter fans take the rumors of this Escape from Earth movie, which was this sort of snake. Okay, that was its in own space. Thing. Okay, uh, movie and combo it with a movie called Ghosts of Mars that John Carpenter ended up making, and just figure they must have been related, but they are not. Nope. Interesting at nope. all. Uh, it's just except for John Carpenter, of course. It is fascinating though that Desolation Williams is dressed almost identical to Snake Plissken. Yeah, he and is. he's got snake vibes. He is, but he's got you know. like the camo pants. He's, he's like a right? softer snake. He's a soft snake. He's got the yeah. camo pants. He's got the black uh, uh, tank top, and then he's got the leather jacket over it. Like he's got the exact same al outfit in slightly different colors. But does he have a snake tattoo he, on his belly that we, possibly goes down? And we don't know. We don't we see. Don't, we won't see. We don't know. We don't see. I, 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 there's a big difference though in these two characters, and that Snake is is never going to show you that he has any emotions. He's kind of sad when uh, Valeria Galino dies in uh, Escape from L.A. When they're mm -hmm. like, "Oh, maybe we could go off and live on an island together," and then she gets shot like right after. He's kind of like, "Oh, that's too bad," but he's never sad really. And desolation in this movie, he, his brother dies. And so he's got like a connection to the world that Snake never had. He didn't really care that much, though. He didn't care? Yeah. I think he cared. He had a little monologue where he's like, yeah, my brother had been through some shit and it was tough for us. And it's a shame that he's gone now. But that's more than Snake would ever give you. He Snake cared more about when Trace died. Sure. Tr Trace was probably my favorite guy. <laughs> so let me give you guys a little bit of what this movie actually was. Um, it's supposed to star Rowdy Roddy Piper. It's supposed to star Statham. Statham was who Carpenter wanted. Oh wait, let let's. I by the way, I have to get this out right away. Statham in this movie, it's sort of a Jeremy Piven thing. He somehow <laughs> looks younger now. Yeah, yes. well, because like, of the hair. Movies, because he just figured out what to do with his hair, and yeah. it, like that's all he he's barely aged otherwise. Right. He basically just looks like Statham, but his hair is kind of dorky. Also, he's rich. Transporters the following year. Is it really that? Jeez. Yeah. Incredible. That's how long it's been. Yeah. Jason's been in our lives. Good for right, him. Right. Because Transporter is the first time that they're like, we present to you leading man Jason Statham. He is right. the guy in the movie. And it's it's truly the difference is he shaves what little hair he has left 
in this movie and he becomes a movie star. Like he becomes a it, bullet-headed man. And you look at him in this and you're like, do you not see at this point that your skull is perfectly shaped? That that <laughs> it's a good skull. That the yeah, hair is actually fucking your bone structure up. Right. It's like you don't know it until you you take the plunge. And it's actually a, it's reveal a white your guys, full skull. Yeah, white guys have a hard time shaving their head because it, it could go totally wrong. I mean, Absolutely. there's a lot of white guys that love it. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I don't know any of them, Jonah. Do you? Some no, of the I don't wrong. go down to Orange County. I don't know them. <laughs> Some of the wrong white guys. But <laughs> it is. But Beach. you look at very many of those gentlemen, and you're like, you do not have the skull shape yeah. to be able to rock this style. And Statham, it's just, it's, it's right there, and he looks weird in this. This is 2001 too, so this is prime Stone Cold Steve Austin territory. It's uh, prime, and Goldberg. Like, w- yeah, yeah, Goldberg, The Rock, Bald- but like. Muscle guys were all the rage back then. And, and Bruce has finally started just letting it be totally bald. Like, not every movie, but every other movie, maybe. Yeah. Matt Smith, that's an actor that should not shave his head. <laughs> From sure, Dunder I don't really... Yes. Right, his hair is really doing a lot of work for him there. Yes, mm. yes. He's got a very specific cube head, Matt Smith. I love the man. <laughs> yeah, I love great the man. actor. Jamadi, though, bald. Let, let that motherfucker be bald. Um... This movie, I don't know. The, the, the generation of it is not as exciting as, you know, whatever. Like Snake Plissken Mars movie I'm turns into something here, else. just seeing here, he just pitched it? He just pitched it at can to some, you know, Euro producer type who was like, yeah, you want to make some movie about Mars? Sounds good. And then he writes it with Larry Sulkis, who's the co-writer of this movie. And then they look at their screenplay and they're like, this is straightforward. What if we move it all around and tell it in this weird kind of like nested flashback style with this kind of weird tricky plot where it's sort of like unfold like which is I feel like the the interesting little gambit of this movie, right? You like, think you think yeah. that the the crossfade had just been invented in that year. <laughs> Seven hundred times he does this. Guys, pin in this, pin in this. I'm coming back to it. I got a grand thesis on the, this movie. It's not a full defense of it, but it's why I think this film is such a weird object. And we're going to circle back to this. I the, think it's important because I think what your that your perspective, whatever it will be, and I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited to reveal the pin. But like, I think that's this is a movie that a lot of sort of genre film fans that i know are like it's straight up good like i know that movie has a horrible reputation and it doesn't deserve it david sounds like you didn't like it that much jonah i'm not sure i totally got your take like are you pro or anti ghosts oh i i you know i i'm fine with i I like it it was i had a good time watching it in theaters i was confused uh and then i didn't really think of it much and then you know rewatch it before this and i was like I, I had a good time. Isn't that what you want in a movie? Like, you know, yeah. it's uh, not to d- Basically dip into how this, not to dip into these hot waters, but like, you know, I had a blast at Halloween Kills and I had a blast watching Ghost of Mars. Do I need to, does it need to be super heavy and good all the time? No, I could just have a good time here and there. I agree with you on that. It, it, I am interested in the fact, it sounds like Jonah, you are the only one of us that saw this in theaters. Did you see it in theaters, Dave? I uh, did I not. Did. Oh no, sorry. That oh, I'm, I'm Dave. Dave. You're David. Okay. No, but it, I'm look, the, two birds, I'm one the blue stone. Blue collar, Dave. Um, no, I did not see it in theaters, but I do remember very well the trailer uh, right. and seeing it all the time and thinking it looked like garbage. <laughs> it was of its to time too. It. it was the new metal era of horror. Yes, right. Absolutely. I remember being 12 or 13 and this coming out, and I would go see any garbage. And my friends and I were like, I mean, we're obviously not seeing Ghosts of Mars, right? Like it was just there's no consideration towards it. it. I had no. Like I did not have enough Carpenter reverence at the age of like fifteen or whatever, but be, and and like Ice Cube and Natasha Hentridge were not enough to grab me. Like I that wasn't going to drag me to the theater. Mars, I like. I liked Mars, but once you put ghosts on there, and then you have fucking Ice Cube and Natasha Hentridge do not make sense together almost. And then the fact that this is presented as being highfalutin enough that John Carpenter has to take credit above the title. I was like, what the fuck is this bullshit? You know, Um, (laughs) I I mean, I remember Escape from L.A. and all that stuff. So I like I like John Carpenter. So I was fine with the John Carpenter. I I mean, I saw this movie right when I moved to Los Angeles and I was I saw it the same week. I saw uh, Wet Hot American Summer. You know, I was just Mm. I was just excited. I mean, it was just because it was an exciting time in my life. That like I just kind of saw and I was, I was like, hey, movies get made. Can't can't wait to get started. Um, yes, that I mean, I 2001 is a good time. 
Uh, nothing bad happened. No. <laughs> hey, this is August. This is August. This, this is, is like August. right when it moved it's out. Still good times. Yeah. A There's whole a few more weeks of, of good times, baby. Yeah. Uh, but I just, I do think it's funny that John Carpenter pitches, you know, go Mars to some Euro guy mm -hmm. who's like, yeah, I'll pony up the money. And he writes the script and he's like, it's kind of a Western about like, you know, sort of unleashing native spirits like he just can't help but no, this is what we come up against western. every single week yeah. guys is he's like but secretly the movie is a western he's the original james mangold he's he's selling you logan <laughs> and then telling you that secretly it's a western every single film yeah. he's just kind of making assault on precinct 13 again just yes. with a more complicated structure well, yeah and it's set on mars i think that's why people do like it he added in a lot of the things he likes in his other movies and then kind of all shoved it into this stuff yeah it's like it's like a summation of his career the, in, in a lot of ways it feels like someone doing a john carpenter homage more than a john carpenter film itself and i think part of the problem why this movie like rubs people the wrong way is it doesn't have i i don't know uh the self-knowing quality if someone was making a tribute to carpenter movies so if the waynes brothers made uh a carpenter movie this would have been it <laughs> allegory movie this would have been Hel mel brooks's high anxiety well i even <laughs> feel like if like if adam wingard made this movie people would be like i totally get it I get what he's doing, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but you need some I distance from that stuff. You need some distance from totally. the thing. That, look, that's the other big thing. It's like he's saying, you know, at the time of this film, like, I wanted to make a stripped down sort of 80s action movie. And when he's referencing the things that he's trying to follow the model of, it's like Predator. He's not quoting his own movies but it's like he's making an homage to the movies at the time that he was making his best films but there isn't enough distance for those to now have this sort of like pastiche charge around them it just feels kind of antiquated i don't think so though because at the time like in 2000 this is 2001 he was making yeah. his uh, last action hero had already come out which was like uh you know very self-referential last boy scout um all the last movies uh but like it's like there was already that turn i believe in in pop culture of like the making fun of the 80s action movies so he might have just been thinking like yeah this is a good time to <laughs> take, but it wasn't take a funny. little jab at it it wasn't really funny though yeah. but this it was done straight it was right it was done straight if you watch reanimator as it like a, a as a you know high drama with a bunch of you know hornet it's gonna seem uh, it's going to seem unfunny. It's going to seem not funny. But on there purpose. are, but there are jokes. There are clear jokes in Reanimator. There are clear moments where it's like we know we've gone really far and we're doing something outrageous, and it kind of brings you back to okay, this is this is meant to be camp or Starship Troopers or RoboCop. I just don't know what people are expecting when they go see a movie called Ghosts of Mars. C Carpenter himself agrees with this right i mean first of all a big thing we keep on coming up against as we've been covering all his movies and reading his interviews at the time and his interviews years later recapping them is he had a real distaste for how postmodern everything had become how every genre movie had to be like super self-aware calling out the frame uh he turned down scream to do vampires instead and was like kind of resentful he turned of down the... halloween h2o but he turned down oh kevin i'm sorry Williams. yes like, i'm sorry turned, yeah, i'm sorry right, i'm yeah, sorry yeah, yeah. yes he turned out kevin williamson because of the distaste for the for the scream thing uh and all of that and uh so that's part one of it and part two is he was like i want this to be sort of tongue-in-cheek and that it's like a throwback to an era of like sillier drive-in movies but he himself agrees with you uh dave that he fucked up by not putting more jokes in it so yeah. he, the thing he said was like he wanted to make a commando rambo 2 predator style movie where quote the universe allows its characters and plot points to be silly without becoming full-fledged comedies like that was the thing he wanted rather than making something that was like self-parodic but then he said like people treat it like it was a badly executed serious horror film and uh and he he himself said i should have made the f film more openly comedic and in on the joke i have no power over what critics say but when people complained about the movie being campy and not scary the name of the movie is ghosts of mars i figured the campiness was self-explanatory <laughs> i i, so I, I have i have to monologue for one second it's I what you said Jonah. he's second. like i fucked up i probably should have put more jokes in it i thought they'd know from the title it was stupid you can get lost in the parody 
let, let me just say yeah. this really quickly and get it out. The, I think the reason why he didn't go too far is because one of the complaints of Escape from L.A. is that it was too ridiculous and too silly. When you've got Snake surfboarding totally. through on Wilshire Boulevard and like uh, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, dude, it's L.A. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of that stuff is so far removed from Escape from New York and from other things of that nature. And he'd also been burned by Big Trouble and Big Trouble being too funny and too campy and outlandish. So I feel like he might have been a little gun shy about going too far. He's been burned by everything at this point. I sure. mean, like, he's 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 very burnt. Yes. But I also, Griff, I also think it's what you're talking. It's not only the sort of ironic filmmaking, but like. I was watching this being like, this is 2001. This is like the sort of height of like kind of Rob Cohen, MTV-esque okay. filmmaking. This, like, this why is sort of my like, big thesis. Yeah. Which, which, which I, to be clear, I don't mind that this movie is not like cut into a million pieces and does not have like a super flashy soundtrack and like really, really buzzy visuals. And like, but you know, like that was the style of the moment. And I do feel like people must have been going to theaters being like, you know, what the hell? Why is this so like slow? Why are people having whole conversations? <laughs> Does that make sense? Absolutely. That This is my whole take. I think a big thing to consider is that what? This movie is August 2001. Uh, yes, correct. And uh, Resident Evil comes out March or April, I believe, 2002. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Paul W.S. Anderson's Resident Evil. And I th- uh, March 2002. Yeah, I think that becomes a big t- a turning point in terms of that is how you execute a John Carpenter style movie in the 2000s that audiences right. will accept while knowing it's a little bit silly. And the whole tone and the visual style becomes very different of how you sell that, where it looks like a fucking music video, yeah. and it's all sort of like cold, antiseptic, and super shiny. And turn quick that cuts. contrast up, crunch mm-hmm. those blacks, right. Right, like he's still going a little classical here for as bug nuts as this movie is down to like, as you said, his biggest effect is the crossfade, right? Like he <laughs> yeah. uses that like it's a revelation. And yeah, Jonah- when David said there was cut, there was all these cuts in the movie, I was like, there was no cuts. There should have <laughs> been cuts. <laughs> but there's also like, there's like an iris wipe and there's yeah. like a fucking like, uh, like swipe at it. and so- Like it's bizarre and you threw out a uh, shilling matrix in 99 that, like you cannot release this movie two years after the matrix no i think that's the other part of this is a certain the types of films that carpenter made split into two essentially at the exact point in time that his career was really slowing down right so one trajectory is like shit like independence day and the matrix and men in black become huge a movies They become movies that now cost so much fucking money, are global blockbusters, and star actual major stars at the peaks of their careers, you know? People coming off of Oscar wins and shit and nominations. And then, like, the thing that's formalizing, that's crystallizing here is the other track of what Screen Gems is going to become with, like, Paul W.S. Anderson movies. Paul W.S. Anderson has just come off of, like, doing Soldier, which was his... Kurt Russell, Carpenter riff that cost way too much fucking money and bombed really hard. And the next thing you know, he drops down to like a much smaller budget and finds his zone. And then, as we said, the next year is also Transporter. Like the Luc Besson produced Europa Corp thing is starting to formalize. And there's this whole new, like, how do you make a movie like this for under $20 million starring someone who's kind of a movie star, but not really, that's a little bit ridiculous, but you play it totally straight and it's just about putting badass shit on screen. And all of them have a pretty fucking similar tone and look that this movie is like the last film holding onto the vestiges of how these things used to be. And so when you watch it now, the thing this feels like is, as you said, sci-fi channel original movies, asylum mockbusters, like any of these things that we now see where you're just like, does anyone know that this thing's ridiculous? You know? Yeah, because yeah the lack it does, of self-awareness is just it, palpable. It doesn't have that... Um, the whatchamacallit, the sort of like slick showmanship, gloss, kind of like badass vibe to it. And I do think the fundamental problem with this movie, I'm getting ding anything, is the casting is wrong. Like he yep. did not find actors who yeah. knew how to toe the lines in the way like you could pair this cast to the cast 
of Escape from New York, which obviously it's going to suffer in comparison, but I think that's a similar one of just like varied character actors playing mm-hmm. different flashy people who pop up and you immediately know that's who they I get are. I what this is, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David? Yep. David? What's that? Donating money to help people can be a wonderful and selfless act. Charity! I'll say this. I I, I truly do uh, love donating money. Uh, it, it was a thing, uh, you know, in the last uh, 18 months when I was uh, confined to my apartment for a lot of this time. Uh, you know, I, I, I feel very uh, silly that I make a living off of doing this uh, goofy podcast. And I, I, I wanted to uh, uh, spread... Uh, the funds around as much as I could, but but it's a stressful endeavor. It's actually very hard figuring out where to donate and and how, you know, uh, which uh, yeah, whether it's for a specific cause or you know a, an incident or whatever it is. It's it's hard to gauge who the the most trustworthy uh, group or, or source is to donate to. There's a lot of charities out there. It's tough to mm-hmm. do that research. Uh, maybe you want to spend hours and hours on all that research, or maybe you just want to visit givewell.org where you're going to get a short vetted list of the best charities they've found at saving or improving lives per dollar, right? Because sometimes I, I get into this thing where I'd be like, oh, uh, yet another just bad thing just happened in the news. I should donate money to something in relation to this. And then I go down the rabbit hole for like six hours. And I'm so stressed out. I don't know what to do, you know? Um, well, it's a tough question to ask. It's a tough question to figure out. Most charities can't tell you how your money will be used or how much good it will accomplish. No, you want to know how much impact your donation will actually have because the worst feeling in the world is to donate to something and feel like they fleeced you and the money's not going where it should. Sure. Uh, and if you want to help people living in poverty with evidence-backed high-impact charities, I recommend you check out GiveWell. They've spent 14 years researching charitable organizations and only recommend a few of the highest-impact evidence-backed charities that they've found. Okay, 50,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $750 million. Rigorous evidence suggests these donations will save tens of thousands of lives and improve the lives of millions more. And here's the best part, Griffin. What? Give well is free. That's Give good because well, I I, that's, I don't want them taking the money. I want to be donating. They're not taking a cut here. Give well wants to empower as many donors as possible to make an informed decision about their donations. They publish all their research and recommendations on their site for free. There's no sign up required. They allocate your tax deductible donation to the charity you choose without taking a cut. Perfect. Perfect. I agree. It's very very much the kind of service you like the internet should be fulfilling you know what i mean it's like the actually like one of the few examples of the function the internet should be uh serving uh to our society and david i don't know if you know this but if you've never donated to give walls recommended charities before you can have your donation matched up to one thousand dollars before the end of the year or as long as your matching funds last wow so to claim that match go to givewell.org and pick podcast and enter blank check at checkout. That's two words, blank check. Make sure they know you heard about Give Well from blank check to get your donation matched. Up to $1,000. That's pretty cool. So I just want to remind people, they go to givewell.org. Then you pick your favorite character from Ghostbusters Afterlife. And you enter your favorite 90s Disney comedy in which a little boy makes out with a, a government agent woman blank check i think the only actor in this movie who's actually totally keyed into what the film is is joanna cassidy i think joanna cassidy has it down yes she does but every she's time been she doing does it. the she's monologues been doing it for decades right she just gets but, it but, she knows but it like hurts to see like pam greer wasted like when like she she rules right you know what yes. i mean like and i like ice cube in lots of movies Same. i enjoy ice cube as an actor but it's sort of what we talked about with village of the damn griff where it does kind of feel like carpenter's like hey you know what you're doing right you know and like right. maybe there needs to be a little more like no you should be bigger here or you should be like tapping into well, this he definitely part of your isn't personality the kind of director that's like gonna like uh go okay i think we're not hitting the emotional uh uh moment here <laughs> right uh, like, it doesn't it seem like that kind of like director no yeah 
He's very much like a blue collar, get it done guy. Yeah, do your I, thing. You know what you're doing. I read yeah. something about why it's it's set at night is because he didn't want to be filming during the day and he wanted to go home and like watch sports or smoke weed or something. He's just like, yeah, I don't cigarettes. I don't need this right now. <laughs> I'll get up and Especially sick. late in his career like this, you know, and like you know, as much as he pitched, like, the, these quotes about Griff, about Mission to Mars. So Mission to Mars, just the De Palma movie, had come out the year before and flopped. Red Planet had flopped. Right. Mission to Mars and, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, Red Planet. Red Planet. Both uh, had been delayed for a while, had big stars, uh, cost too much money, come out, uh, and both flop really hard. And Ghost of Mars goes into production right after they had been released. And Carpenter's got this great quote, which is, the studio is probably worried about it, but what are you going to have? Ghosts of Pluto? <laughs> 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 like, People know Mars! But then, you know, he talks about it, or he's like, I'd always wanted to film Mars, but I didn't have a story. And after Vampires came out, I went and thought about Mars again. I thought I could do something with it and make it different. But then he also says the primary reason that it's set on Mars is that the color is red. And like, I thought that was cool. Like, I don't know that he actually has a big Mars take here. He's just kind of doing a sci-fi Western thing. Well, right? he was he was doing, I mean, the vampires is a vampire's Western. You yes. know, it's a vampire. West, and it also takes place in a lot of kind of deserty kind of stuff. So maybe he was kind of tinkering around in his head like, oh, this could, this desert climate could look like Mars. You know, maybe yeah. that, he also, uh, as as sort of pointed out, he said Mars is really not a red planet. During the daylight hours, it's pink. I didn't think I could do a horror movie on a pink set. That's why the film <laughs> takes place at night. <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted to be scientifically accurate. So it's like I it'll just, be nighttime. There's only one great Mars movie, and it's it's Total Recall. And that is the, the for Mars Holmans. needs moms. What the fuck are you going on about? <laughs> oh, sorry, bud. How sorry, I forgot you. your favorite movie of all time. It, that that's the tone that this movie should have hit is yes. Verhoeven, uh, outrageous violence and comedic uh, circumstances that remind you. Oh, I know. I there's a joke here. Um, there are some moments that really do hit that though. Every single time someone gets decapitated, I laugh because it's always mm. like a medium shot and you see their face and they make like a grimace and then the head just goes flying in exactly those the right great. way. The, the, I the, love the all limbs the limbs coming off, the limbs coming off and the heads coming off are great. Yes. It's not the kills. It is just the tone of 90% of the movie and the fact that it looks like garbage. For me, the thing that threw me off the most was the crossfades. And I, I'm going to be, because it says someone that's had arguments and edit bays with people where I go, eh, maybe a crossfade here. And then the guy go, no, no cross. Every editor hates a crossfade. So I'm wondering who was in there doing that. Because every editor I've ever known hates crossfades. I just think that's a Carpenter thing. That's I do. All and John. I, yeah. I think like, uh, where was it here? Uh, Ice Cube had this quote. Where he's like, uh, this he said this in Hustler magazine in 2008. Okay, so he's <laughs> oh, yeah, nursing, I I bet that was a nursing his wounds. Yeah, yeah. I, I have that later. one still under my yeah, bed. Absolutely, he said. I mean, I don't think I should have done Ghost of Mars. I don't like that movie. I'm a big fan of John Carpenter. The only reason I did it was because John Carpenter directed, but they really didn't have the money to pull the special effects off. It was a movie that should have been done in 1979. So, like, you look at the crossfades in this movie and you're like, this feels like something I would discover in a busted VHS from 1979. And, like, the crossfades would be part of the charm in it. And there's a cognitive dissonance to watching it with actors who you know that's that person in 2001. Like even mm. now, twenty years on, the movie is locked into the time it came out, and you're like, "That's the wrong editing style for this era." Yeah, I will say that this is interesting. Apparently, Ice Cube turned John Carpenter onto using Pro Tools, using <laughs> this Griffin. He and, and then Carpenter's just excitedly like, "Yeah, you can see the waveforms and you can chop them up." Like he's just describing Pro Tools. That's so I guess I got a movie all at home. Fuck that. No, I'm Ice not. Cube got Carpenter. Into like a new level of of basic of synthesizing. I mean that I guess that's that's why Carpenter keeps making music to this day is is thanks to Ice Cube. That's fun. That rules. Uh, um, and then Courtney Courtney Love Griffin was supposed to be the female lead of this movie. Correct. I don't know if that's better. Hmm. I like Courtney Love in some movies, but I, yes, Natasha Hinstridge is not good in this. Yeah, Natasha Hinstridge is not good in this i mean that's no. that's like a fundamental thing for me the three yeah. his three top choices were apparently michelle yo great sure. the franco patente sure famke jensen sure sure she could do the action but like all three of those make a lot of sense 
And then they cast Courtney Love. And what I read here is that I'm just going to read this verbatim as it says on the Wikipedia. So who knows if this is accurate or not. She she left the project after her then boyfriend's ex-wife ran over her foot Correct. in her car while yep. she was in training. I read that. That too. is accurate. Uh, she that ran over wild. Courtney Love's foot with a Volvo. Uh, so Natasha Oof. Henstridge. How do you say her last name? Henstridge. Henstridge. I think Henstridge. So. Henstridge. Henstridge. Yeah. yeah, I watched Species a lot as a kid, so I know how to say her name. <laughs> well, I don't want to be mean about her because, like, she's. You can be. I'm mean sure about she's her. not. But like. With Ice Cube, I'm like, look, if you use that guy right, he can actually be a terrific actor. He's Correct. a really fun movie presence. Right. I don't think there's anything Natasha Henstridge has done where I'm like, that's that stands out. Like that's no. you know, like she's just sort of like a C list kind of Ice Queen type. I right? was gonna you know, say, she's like, I okay, s- I swear it's not just horniness talking, but she is very effective in Species. But it's one of sure. those things where it's like, this is the exact thing you can hire her to do. Well, Species is also just like glorious 90s trash. It's a very lovable, stupid she thing. She is like, who you go to if you cannot get Sharon Stone. That's a fact. Yeah, That's she's it. got sort of a Sharon Stone thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and like, and also Species, you're surrounding her with like five of the best actors alive at yeah, that moment. It, it, it is wild how, how stacked the Species cast ben is. Ben Kingsley, <laughs> Alfred Molina, Molina, Forrest Whitaker. Michelle Williams uh, yeah, plays I, the young Natasha Henstridge. She does. Uh, species is fun. I yeah. guess, but like, is it? it's a last minute thing. Carpenter is clearly, he, he speaks very highly of her. He says, she's my kind of actor. She's in the vein of Kurt Russell, Sam Neill, and Jeff Bridges, which apparently that's Carpenter's top three collaborator list. Wow. That's fair. That's fair. Um, And then, you know, like... Yeah, she she's fine. They did the Blu-ray commentary together. They did the commentary they together did. for the the home video release. They clearly like each other. She's fine is about as as strong as I could possibly be about her in this movie. She's bad to she, fine. She's she's fine. Uh, but you need someone who's like electric in this, and she's sort of doing the bare minimum to pull this movie off, which it needs a really kind of like firecracker star performance. I think. Um. Or, or at least someone very steady, because in theory, Desolation Jones is going to be your sort of like wild card character, and he's not sort of going big enough. Maybe no, he's got a real steady hand. Yeah, he's yeah. whispering a lot of the movie. Like I want to see Ice Cube scream at somebody with right. a lot of expletives or something, but he goes and is, he's doing Snake. He's doing Snake Plissken. He kind of is. I want to see. Are we there yet, Ice Cube? Yelling like, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. that's at what you want. Jump Street. But no, but that was my exact thought. If he was in this movie with 21 Jump Street energy, it would work. Like, he yep. hadn't totally figured out how to harness everything in his power. And obviously, he has good performances before 21 Jump Street, many like of them. Kings or whatever. I mean, but and I then like fucking yeah. Friday. And-, and Friday and all that. But, like, do you think it's just Boys in the Hood, obviously? But, like, do you think it's just that he's in a Carpenter movie and he's like, I should be serious? Like... This is like this is the master of horror. Like I, I should mean, not be goofy. I should go for serious. I just I think, don't know. Yeah, I think styles of acting had changed, and I think you're dealing yeah, with sure your two main characters are people who don't have formal acting backgrounds, right? Like a rapper and, and, turned actor and, and a model turned actor. Yeah, think of uh, think of Jeff Bridges and Kurt Russell were both child actors. Yeah, right, right. That, both people like, who knew everything inside. It. Right, right, yes. and yeah. were very savvy and canny. Like he had people who understood that control the dial. I, I think the key thing with Carpenter actors is people need to know exactly what movie they're in because I think you're right, Jonah. He probably is not someone who's getting. In, uh, particularly granular in his direction with actors, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. It's like he's casting and he's giving the basic outline of like, this is the kind of guy I want here, but he might not be finessing it take by take. And yeah. I think Ice Cube and Hensworth just are uh, still a little bit too green. And I think the movies in which both of them have been good up until this point are like perfect fits working with good directors or things that a fucking Ice Cube wrote himself, right? Yes. Or, yeah. I mean, and, yeah, I mean, and also let's not forget, I mean, this is Statham's basically his first non-Guy Ritchie movie. Like Correct. he's pretty green, uh, you know, this he is He gets not, it enough though. Like he, he does his I think his he's thing. fine. He's fine. Yeah. He doesn't have much to do. Pam I mean, like, Greer obviously gets it in her limited screen time. But then they're damn heads on a spot. Like, yeah, I also God feel like because watching this, you're like the second she shows up, you're like fucking yes, like fucking 
Ghosts of Mars, and she's the boss. Right. She's the yeah, boss. Yeah. Absolutely. Not only does she die disappointingly fast, but I also think there's a little bit of energy to her performance of like, really, I'm back to doing this shit again. Like Tarantino yeah. just saved me. I was a legitimate lead actress. No one knew what to do with me. And now she's in 2001 doing the type of movie she would have done in 1979. You know, I'm, I'm also a little bit bothered by these at least the two most memorable performances that she has in Carpenter movies from my perspective. Mm -hmm. In Escape from L.A., he makes her a trans woman who we're supposed to laugh at. Like, isn't it funny Car that Carjack she Bond. used to, that she was a guy? I'm like, okay. Bummer. And then this, the joke is she's a lesbian. And so he's doing this weird thing where he takes maybe the sexiest woman ever to live. And he both desexualizes her in in ways contemporary two thousand one ways of like oh she's trans uh, that's, that's she can't be a sex object because she's trans, or he makes her a lesbian and turns that into a joke and it's just odd to me and I don't like it, I don't like it in both I, cases. I think that is an incredibly good call, Dave. I do think, it, I mean. It, Escape from L.A. is the year before Jackie Brown, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. this yep. now comes four years after Jackie Brown. And you look at the other stuff that happens in that time. And it's like, you know, Jane Campion puts her in Holy Smoke. You know, she's in Into Deep, uh, uh, Jawbreaker. But then by like 2000, she's already playing like Chevy Chase's boss at the news station in Snow Day. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and then this year is Ghosts of Mars. No offense to producer Ben. Also, Bones, a movie he's currently wearing a T-shirt from. <laughs> Hell yeah. Saw that. You know, the year after that's Adventures of Pluto Nash. Like the thing that Tarantino tapped into, I think, in terms of figuring out how to use her dramatic actress outside of genre movies is like, this is the fucking toughest woman in the world. Right. And he turned that into like emotional fortitude in Jackie Brown. And most people just turn that into she's a badass. And I think Carpenter unfortunately turned too literally into she's like a man. Yep. You know? <laughs> exactly. Like both of the things you describe are just like, well, the joke is she acts like a man. And one of them mm -hmm. it's because she was assigned male at birth and the other one's because she wants to fuck women. But like no one knew how to use her the way that Tarantino did where it's like she is fundamentally a woman and she is like so much tougher than anyone else on screen just in terms of her like uh, emotional strength. I I will say that she speaks very highly both of this experience and of Carpenter. Uh, she I like this quote from her where she's basically like, "I have no aversions to doing movies like Ghosts of Mars. It's the type of movie that put food on my table thirty years ago, and I'm lucky to still be able to do action films." I mean, she seems like a fairly unpretentious in terms of her career because, like, whatever, she's kind of done it all over the years. Let me just say one thing from a, from a perspective of a black person because mm -hmm. I think it's important to note that when you have been marginalized in a career field, you are going to be grateful naturally do i think that she loved doing these probably not but maybe she did maybe she did maybe she did but either way like it is it is incumbent upon you to never uh do anything to uh possibly risk your livelihood because it can so easily be taken from you and when you think about her career and what you descri described griffin yeah her career and her choices what she had to do after that huge success where somebody uh, from the top of the Hollywood food chain says, you have talent, you have ability, I'm going to write a, a movie for you to do. Mm -hmm. And then after that, nothing. Why is that? Well, it's because we don't get those opportunities. We never will unless we, have, unless we are willing to take the shit that people throw at us. And I think on top of that, Dave... There, there are other black actors like Samuel Jackson who's like, I'm so grateful that I get to work. I don't turn my nose down at anything, right? Like, I'll take any job. You know, I like movies. I have no pretension about it. Sure. And then there are other black actors who are maybe in a, a Pam Greer position where it's like, I got the big role. I worked with the big director. I got an Oscar nomination or a win or I had the Oscar buzz. And then, like, no one gave me the good parts. Why didn't this happen? And they openly talk about that, and they very quickly get pegged as difficult and unhirable. Mo Monique. Right. 
Monique's, Monique's a perfect won, example. Monique's Oscar. a great example. Lou Gossett Jr. is another one who always yep. talks about, like, why the fuck did I not get the parts I should have gotten? Why was I doing Iron Eagles after I won an Oscar? You know? Right, and, mm-hmm. and, and then, right, quickly, how it's like, okay, mister. Okay, Lou. Just, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, all, all true. I mean, also, I mean, how, how old is Pam? I'm trying, I'm trying to just track Pam Greer is 72 so now, so she's right, 50. Right, so she's 50, early 50s, which yeah. makes us, yeah. I, the funniest thing about these quotes, I mean, she... The, uh, JJ, I can't read all these quotes because they're so long, but they're so good. She's a very, very, very entertaining public speaker, is mm-hmm. is how I will put it. Um, but she clearly kind of pumped Carpenter on the like matriarchy stuff because she's like, "What's going on? I love this idea, but what are you talking about? Like, how has <laughs> yeah. how has it evolved this way? Like, why is Mars a, a matriarchy? Is it because women were sent there?" away from earth for some specific reason and he wouldn't really commit to an answer <laughs> um but she was just sort of like i need more to understand for my character like you know so she just kind of comes up with ideas for herself but uh i do it's something that i want to know more i'm like pam Cre- i'd like to know more about what is going on in his wider universe here and i don't know if he is that interested or just doesn't have the time because he's making a very specific tale i don't really know i i I read a quote where he said that the reason why he did a matriarchal society in this movie is so he didn't have to explain why women were tough which is an interesting thing sure um i i'm not blaming him for for how weird that sounds because it was 2001 and there are there were still a lot of people who found uh, a reason to object to women being tough in movies. Um, But it it doesn't really, it seems like a completely unnecessary world building detail. But it is one of the things. It's odd to flash it on screen. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why people come back to the movie though. I think. Well, if he's got the the script, it's a lot of, a lot of tough female leads and like, it's like notes start coming in from the studio going, it's like, I don't understand why why are all these women tough? He's like, I don't know. It's a matriarchal society. That's why they're tough. I guess. (laughs) And like, they're like, yeah. "Yeah." Oh, 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 wow. Yes, yes, yes. And so it's like, you never know the process getting That's it exactly to you. That's exactly what it feels like. Good to me survival too, right. uh, technique. Right, yeah. Absolutely. It it does end up being. I mean, I I kind of am inclined to believe that he sort of fell into it, not by accident, but as like you know a way to absorb the notes, as you're saying, Jonah. But it is this rare example of like I feel like most Carpenter films a thing a thing we have been lauding about them. David is or lauding them for is um like man, he just keeps it so basic. And stripped down. You don't need to explain stuff more. Here's all you need to get the setup of the movie out of the way, right? And this is one of the only movies, if not the only movie, where he accidentally made a world where you keep on wanting to go like, wait, can we circle back to that thing? (laughs) What's going on there? That's maybe more interesting than what this movie is about. David. Hello. The holidays could be hectic. Uh, That's true. Very hectic. I Yeah. I'm sweating these holidays. Scott Calvin, I don't know if you know about this guy. Mm. He sets a turkey on fire, trying to make dinner for his son. Yeah, that's true. On Christmas Eve, his wife with the Mia Wallace haircut and her dorky therapist boyfriend just drops the son off at the doorstep. He's here. He's 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 mucking it all up. He brings him to Denny's. And then as if that wasn't bad enough, he ends off the night accidentally murdering Santa Claus. Yeah, I mean, you're just giving me the Santa Claus uh, uh, plot first 20 minutes here, but it's all true. Then he's on the hook. He has to spend the next, I don't know, centuries, millennia being Santa Claus rather than having to live a normal guy life. The point is this all could have been avoided if he had HelloFresh. That's true because HelloFresh, it makes you get fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep, right? You have, you get to skip all this hectic stuff that you're talking about, like Denny's visits and Santa murder. Because HelloFresh... And that's what you want. You want the ingredients delivered to your doorstep rather than Santa falling off a roof and then onto your doorstep. Dead. No, I, exactly. And HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from each week, including vegetarian, calorie-smart, gourmet options. They got all kinds of variety. Mm-hmm. Uh, fall, I don't know about this, I mean, but you're talking about the Santa Claus, so maybe I can tell you that fall is transitioning to winter. So maybe you mm. want to cozy up with a comforting meal like chicken ramen and show you style broth 
or turkey ragu gnocchi. Hello. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that sound warm and comforting? Hello. Uh, Hello Fresh. It's got flexibility. You can customize your order on the app within minutes. You can change your delivery day, your food preferences, your plan size. You can skip a week if you need to. Uh, makes the holidays easier, Griffin. That's all we're looking for. We're looking for our life to be easier and not get sucked into some never-ending series of clauses that will upend all of our interpersonal relationships. Uh, and that's what exactly because those clauses they keep going, Griffin. There's always they keep more. on getting you with the clauses. Um, There's always another clause. All right, I'm going to call to action. Do it. Go to hellofresh.com/slash fourteen check. And use code 14 check for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts, Griffin. HelloFresh.com. David, we should clarify. It's not forky check. It's 14. One four check. That's numeral one four check. Uh, that's true. HelloFresh.com. People could get confused. They could. HelloFresh.com slash 14 check. Uh, one four check. And use code 14 check for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts gifts this is america's number one meal kit we love it it's HelloFresh. check it out i mean i just want to read like verbatim because it's maybe why i was just jazzed on this week because it's hard for me to to lose faith in a movie that starts this strongly but you have your like fucking opening credits right then the narrator mm-hmm. says for weeks rumors have spread across mars which is for me a perfect opening line that's exactly how i want every movie <laughs> to open also re- reading what's on the screen and also listening to the vo almost simultaneously was Absolutely. a trip right and then the the title cards on screen are mars 2176 ad terraforming 84% complete earth like atmosphere population 640,000 colonists society colon matriarchal I, I love all of this. Earth law enforced by Mars police force. <laughs> like, just incredible. Incredible. That's just how all movies should begin. There's a line at the end after the hearing has concluded where someone says something like, the cartel won't believe this. And I'm like, what cartel? Cartel of yeah. what? What I mean, are they that's... carteling here? Drugs or money? Or like, what is happening? Mar- Mars dust. Jesus. Delicious Mars <laughs> dust. The spice must flow. Yes. The irony is like when Zack Snyder does Army of the Dead, right? Which I like mm. like a fair amount and had certain issues with. And most of my issues were tied to this sort of front loading of expanded universe shit. Where it's yeah. like that for me should be a lean ass 90 to 100 minute Carpenter style movie where you just get maximum fucking impact out of that premise and those characters. And instead he's setting up all these other tendrils because it's like, well, they're doing a Netflix anime series and there's going to be comic books and there's a prequel movie coming out next month and all this sort of shit. And I'm like, just give me the fucking Army of the Dead bank heist casino heist zombie movie and then this one i'm like i want fucking 15 spinoffs i want to know about all these what was the cartel tell me about that give me the adventures of young desolation williams that's the thing about like with the the army of the dead thing just real quick it's like it's like yeah he has all this like world building stuff that you don't really need uh but but like train to busan that which also has a has a manga uh and uh and Mm -hmm. you know and a a anime prequel and and all this stuff it's like and I you didn't know you don't you don't know you don't need that shit. No. And it's like and Carpenter's so good at doing that. But then like when he gives you a little hint and you're like, but what about over there? What's through that door? Don't mind that door. It's just you just have to know that that door. He does there. it all the time. Escape from New York and Escape from L.A. do this constantly. Where it's like Fresno Bob did this thing, or what happened in Cleveland, or you know what happened to the U.S. government? Why are they crazy Christian fascists now? Like all of that stuff is cool in the in the context of a very tight, clear narrative. It's yes, fun yeah. to get the world building when you know I am going from point A to point C by the end of this thing. I think a good example of like like world building just established without just like you get little hints of how it's a uh, Daybreakers, the uh, that vampire movie. Oh which yeah, I think it's like you know it's like it's like it's like did they take time to go and this is how we built the subwalks so people could be walking around during the day and not get hurt because they're vampires. It's like no, you just go. It's like hey, take the subwalk over. It's like you just know. It's that's that's how it should be. Yeah. Right. I like that Mars has choo-choo trains. 
<laughs> David loves trains. We should acknowledge here that David boo, is a big boo, train trains. fan. I almost wanted the whole movie to take place on a train, which feels like what happens if this movie has a ten million dollar budget or whatever, where they're yes. like, "We're on Mars, the Mars train," right? And then, like, yeah. you just sort of see Mars going by in the windows or whatever. <laughs> I, I worry that it is a budget thing with Carpenter, where the more money he has the more he is able to do things that are outside of his comfort zone. And if if yeah. this movie was as stripped down as you said, where it was like it's just on the train or it's just in a building or whatever, then I think he, he'd be forced to tell a really uh, tight narrative. But when he's got all this money and he's like, well, I guess I could just do these like weird flashbacks and stuff and we can have fire and all but these why places. the crossfades even within people walking down a hallway? Because he not won't talking. give up his bag of tricks. I mean, his whole thing is he's like, I'm a classicist. Even when he was at his peak in the 70s and 80s, he was like, people don't like me because I'm still doing things the way Howard Hawks did them. I don't care about the tricks these kids are doing. And so not only is he like not catching up with his contemporaries but he's staying back at his previous throwback style that he's and like doubling down right yeah right. he is doubling down i think to sort of like make a, a statement there it also is this weird like we're saying like oh he has too much money for this movie but too much money for him is 28 million dollars which at right. this I think point it might in time, be his third highest budget i ever, think so Griff. too Escape from L.A. is obviously number one. I think uh, Invisible Man is probably number two. And this is right yes. behind those two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I yeah. I, th I, think it's like he's in this zone now where Carpenter-style movies are frequently costing over $100 million. So you're watching this and you're like, this needs to either cost over 70 or under 15. Like either it needs right. to be really contained yep. and low stakes and sort of like bootstrappy or it needs to be like Carpenter's finally getting – all the the tools in the toolbox although if escape from la proves us anything uh, carpenter seems very ill at ease with cgi and yep. more mm -hmm. modern special effects well i think that, that we should dub this the carpenter zone this budget range where someone who doesn't have the grasp on technology can make a tight taut thriller a fun genre movie and he simply can't do it any higher than what that zone is. If you look at the movies he made that were real studio pictures, like big budget studio pictures, uh, at least for the time, they just don't click the way that a story, even, a, even Big Trouble is a story that, even though it's got a lot of uh, hoo-hahs and dickety doos on top of it, is is linear like they it's have to go story. into the palace yeah. they have to go underground they have to rescue uh kim cattrall and they have to leave like that's perfect this is what john carpenter does so well is tell a classic story in a classical fashion and unfortunately you can't tell a wild story with <laughs> a bunch of wide shots and a bunch of guys in goofy costumes and also, like, the the times he does choose to go into close-ups during conversations was very off-putting as well. Yeah. Like it happens, I think, three different conversations where you're like, wow, now all of a sudden we're just right up on their face. Yeah, leave me alone. Get off me, Natasha Hinstridge. Good grief. All right, I just, I just, uh, I just reverse engineered a way for me to be okay with the uh, crossfades. So... The whole movie takes place uh, with Natasha Hentress's character uh, telling the story of what right. happened. We haven't even talked about the weird nesting doll structure. And she's, and right. she's on some sort of narcotic, too. S and yeah. she's on some sort of narcotic. So this is like, so what we're seeing is her point of view and memory is a bit, uh, you know, uh, wibbly wobbly. And yes. so that's like, so when she's thinking about it, remembering it, we're seeing it from her brain's perspective, which is a bit cross fadey, like kind of combining times and sliding around and stuff like that. Therefore, I think the cross fading is a great use in this film. <laughs> I love you film schooled your way into this being a good movie. <laughs> you don't see the cross fades at the, fuck, at the thing when they're just talking to the board. Too it's more bizarre than that because it's like okay she's under questioning right she's like drugged up then she's telling you her interpretation or her memory you don't know how reliable it is of what happened and then so often in that story she says to someone what happened here and you get the flashback of their perception of yeah. what happened so it's like he's not going full Rashomon with it but it it is interesting how much this movie foregoes uh, narrative propulsion for this sort of like, uh, I don't know what's happening here, kind of like yeah. diffusion of, of truth. 
just even the idea too of like uh since it is her memory and they're like did the did the ghosts of mars speak she's like yes i couldn't really hear him it was really loud but it sounded like <laughs> or something like that i don't know it was another kind of language i'm pretty sure it was something martian like that that voice was a was a choice as well this is another thing we literally have not even touched on once yet this episode which is the hook of this movie is that uh, there are ghosts. I don't think they're ghosts. In no, Mars. they're ghosts. They're called ghosts of Mars. Yes. They were the original, the natives of Mars who died and their souls got trapped in the planet. Yep. After yeah, we colonized it, they discovered, mm -hmm. you know, the sort of abandoned. We, mi we mine too deep. It's a classic we, mine we mined too deep type thing. Opened right. a door we shouldn't have opened. Perhaps and, ghosts yeah. is the best way for our feeble human minds to interpret them yeah. what if that was that that what if those are the martians they're not uh we're, they're not gonna have human bodies or any kind of physical body wow. like that they're just these um uh, almost like a, a invasion of the body snatchers they're just these things that float jonah did they say that in the movie did they say that in the movie jonah no they did not they're ghosts they call well, them ghosts. But I, I like asking these questions they call sure. them ghosts yeah but, but you're uh, saying what if they never had a, a physical form this is always the state they existed in yeah Right, because they do have a sort of evolutionary survival thing where, like, if you kill the body they're in, they can just move to another body. It does almost could they be like symbiotic creatures that right. kind that's of what just, I'm thinking. Like, that's how they okay. live. Yeah, Listen, maybe we're gonna have Dan Aykroyd on our podcast in a couple weeks, He'll, so we'll just ask good. Dan what he good. thinks. Perfect. Well, th here's my question then. Like, okay, so there's what's his name, Big Daddy Mars? Big Daddy Mars, yeah. <laughs> Big Die Mars, who's sort of the the character looming over the poster, the Glenn Danzig Going of it like all. This, right? Going like, like this. Uh, very Danzig like. I interpreted him to be like what the pure Martian form was once, because th once these people become possessed with the quote unquote ghosts they of Mars, they kind of like scar their faces up and go crazy, carve up right. their faces, and they make weapons, and it sort of looks like they're doing it in tribute to this guy, whereas his weird like ridges on his face seem to be baked into his his physical form it's not a it's not a scarring it's his actual mm -hmm. skin texture i don't know i mean i just i do like the premise of there are these things floating around and they possess your body and if you kill the possessed person then they jump into a different body like i think that's a fun carpenter yeah. problem but they kill so many of them how often do the, does that even that possession even happen they kill like hundreds of these yes. guys, and there's only maybe three or four possessions. And the first one we see is the one where they kill the prisoner, and then uh, Natasha Hinstridge gets uh, gets possessed, and then she, it's she spits it out because she's on that drug. It happens like an hour and fifteen minutes into the movie. Yes, yes. I was unclear yeah. <laughs> about the rules of the, of the ghost. Wait, possession. but I I kind of loved that. Like I think there's something to that. Like the idea of being possessed, but then you trip on acid and it fucks with the ghost. Mm. <laughs> and I really it's feel a, like it's a pro drug movie. Well, kind of, but I feel like yeah. I wanted to see them all sort of have to take the drugs in order to not be possessed. Like there's something yeah. there. I think that's an interesting mm. idea I've never seen before. Yeah, yeah, and there's, I mean, uh, who is it? Is it Dose or Trace who starts huffing that inhaler? Oh, right. And oh, cuts the one that cuts his off. hand off. Yeah, right. I think it's He's just doing whippets. Yeah. Right. And that was a super funny moment. That's a great joke. That's a great thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just, there is something interesting in this movie's argument that, like, the most effective way to combat these ghosts are to fuck with your own brain. <laughs> <laughs> I almost wish there was more of that I, I if if you know it, it's a little bit of a problem that the movie has to kind of turn into a shootout at the end when we're like we kind of know that doesn't work like yeah, yeah. you know we, we we maybe should just throw the guns away at a certain point like if they just started eating spicy food or something you know what I mean? like, <laughs> extreme heartburn knocks them right yeah, right yeah exactly uh, i i guess i'm confused if this is a metaphor for colonization how the drug thing then fits into that elaborate metaphor about um, <laughs> destroying a native culture. I, I don't get that part. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Carpenter has never been one to get too worked up about those kinds of deep, right? You know what I mean? Like, he's right. like, well, that's where the story goes. I don't know. Like, yeah, why but not? That doesn't, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's that's cool. Um, yeah. So I guess that is this far. But yeah, I mean, 
it's what's Griffin saying. Like, I don't object to anything uh, about the sort of like fringy details of this movie. I just want more. And I understand that that can't fit into a 90 minute genre movie. That's fine. Like, but I, I, it is one of those movies where I'm like, well, I'd like to think about all of these ideas you're throwing at me. Uh, yeah. I almost want everyone to calm down a little bit, but there's no time to calm down. We got to fight the ghosts of Mars. Like, you know, so it goes. But I do think a, a, a failing of his, I mean, yes, it, there's, there's the thing with him where it's like almost always these movies start from him having some kind of vaguely sociopolitical idea, right? And then from there, he just comes up with what he thinks is an entertaining genre film. And he doesn't really worry about tracking whatever the starting metaphor was onto every beat of it because he's like – his whole attitude has been like, I'm not here to yell at people or teach them anything. I want them entertained, but maybe there's a germ of the thing that that makes them think a little bit. I do think – he hasn't solved some of the basic how to make this movie entertaining questions yeah. where it's like you do sure. get into that problem in the last half hour that it's like, so wait, how do they stop th these things? Well, here's an action sequence where they all load up on guns and bombs and go in and try to fight them in a way that you know is futile. <laughs> yeah, and that whole sequence just feels like a waste of 10 minutes. The nuke thing was like, come yeah. on, what's with the nuke? There's no way you can nuke a ghost. What is right. this? Right, you just know that this is a, a waste of time. We should mention they're not ghosts, Dave. So you can nuke them. They're organisms. All right, all right. we're gonna have a fight about this. At some point, <laughs> I, aren't we? Like you just you're taking the title literally. We are humans with they our very. They, they call them ghosts. They call them ghosts because they're humans. They don't know oh, their brother. It's like, it's like, did you notice that those people when the the things go inside of them, the ghosts as you call them, they do not speak any kind of English. Maybe it's just our human brains. All we know are like this seems like possession, seems like ghosts. That's all what that's what we're calling them. They just float out of that fucking place and then just start going inside of everybody. I don't know. They they're just organisms. All I'm saying is that I'm going based on the text, and you are extrapolating based on your own desire for these not to be ghosts. And I don't does, know did why they you're speak so anti English. Did that, at any point, does any of those people go? We are the ghosts of Mars. None of Never. them fucking oh, do. They don't self-identify oh, as ghosts. Would they don't self-identify cool. as ghosts. Okay, well then it's yeah, not up to cool. me to identify them as ghosts. Fine. You win, Jonah. You Hooray! Win. Not... That's how many points do I get now? I'm not sure how this show works. Hashtag points. <laughs> do you get 10 ghost points? <laughs> 10 ghost points. That's, that's cool. Yeah. I, it's, they were trapped beyond a, like a cursed door. I'd like to see the movie... Uh, like where you have to corral these spirits and somehow kind of like drive them back beyond some, you know, ancient door and then close right. the door behind yeah. them. That, yeah. That'd be fun. I don't know. There's got to be rules to supernatural stuff in uh, in any movie, but especially right. in a horror where I, I don't you have to quite, win. This was hard sci-fi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah again, I basically... Hard. I enjoyed this movie. My wife's sitting next to me while I'm watching it, and every five minutes she would just look up and be like, Wait, what did they just say? Like, mm. if you just kind right. of like glancingly observe this movie, it just throws a lot of ideas out there. <laughs> That's all. That's my thing. I'm like, I, I, this movie has a thousand problems. I think it's a weird curio. It's stuck in between like a lot of different uh, phases of, of film culture. It's sort of neither fish nor fowl. I find it entertaining. I just find it enjoyable to watch. And I sort of would love to see more movies be this uh thoroughly uh silly like films of this ill malignant is the new ghosts of mars absolutely yes well i think th i think that's that's the sad thing about this film and about carpenter and where he is now in his in his life and his career is that if he was going uh, you know 110% right now making movies people would eat that shit up because we do yeah. have this hankering for camp. We have this, yeah. silliness. And, and just and, solid right. filmmaking. Like yeah. If he just churned out what for him are six out of ten movies, you know, he's, he's old, but he's not like ancient. Like, we would all be hooting and hollering for them right. now. And instead, he's just kind of like, whatever. Yeah. Lynch could make uh, Twin Peaks season three, and, and yeah. he's old. Like, there's still people working. God, Clint Eastwood is 90 years old, and he's acting. I mean, also, Carpenter does go on tour. He does He, he does. He's, long does he's doing yeah. stuff. I don't right. begrudge that. I do. It does seem, as Griff, we've been covering these new 90s movies. In yeah. every interview, he's a little more embittered. He's a little more like, I don't know why I keep doing this. Like, he, it's you can feel it piling up with him mm -hmm. and clearly i'm looking forward to see what happens what what you guys find when you see, find interviews of the ward when he's promoting that one we'll get there i mean he said after this movie he was like i think this is it i think i'm retired and he came out of this movie especially after it bombed and was trashed so hard being like yeah i'm done 
I'm done. Yeah, like, and then when, he does a couple TV episodes of Masters right. of Horror, as we know, right? And then the the ward is the one where I'm like, why did he do that? I don't know. Yeah. We'll find out. I suppose we'll find out. Do you know Griff? I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't. Hopefully, our guests will have some insight. I don't really know, but um, right. yeah, this is the one. I mean, where's this? There was a good quote that uh, JJ uh, pulled up here. Um, I mean, he's he's like, you know, talking about just. Uh, uh, where where was it? Uh, they asked him in 2001 his thoughts about retiring, right? And he said, I've been trying to do that for a year, sure. I'd love to retire. I think there's a time when you just have to lay down when it becomes too hard. It's just fighting the same problem over and over if you make the films I want to make. I'm just stubborn, I guess, but there may come a time where I'll think, yeah, it's just not worth it anymore. And he says that in September 2001. Nope. And and then like a couple months after that, he's like, yeah, no, I think that's right. What's wild about that 2001 interview was it was September 12th. I mean, why was he even talking was, about him? <laughs> so he called, called up. them up. Yeah, Come on, you, can't, you gotta cancel. Show some respect. I have some things to say. I have some things to get off my chest. Um, and this is an interview he does with the AV Club in 2011. He said, it hit me when I was looking at the extras for the DVD of Ghosts of Mars. It showed me at the beginning of the process on the set. I looked okay. And then it showed me at the very end of the process doing the music. I was like a dead man. Oh. Dead man walking. And I thought, so okay. So it's like being president or whatever? You yeah. just like aged 10 yeah. years okay. in a year? All right. Yeah. I can't do this for a while. I just can't. I thought it was a good time to stop. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I saw a bloody disgusting piece mm-hmm. he did, or uh, an interview he did, where he says, the ward... A script came to him at the right time, right after um, Masters of Horror, where he was kind of like jazzed again. So I feel like he's one of those people, sort of similar to when you get divorced and you you see your ex wife in the right light, and you're like, well, maybe. What if? What if? Yes. <laughs> hey, and then uh, and then something yeah. horrible happens where you're like, oh, we hate each other. That's right. I mean, you are the only uh, divorced man on this episode right now, but that that's, it sounds like a very good analogy and is certainly a thing we found in covering these movies week to week is like everyone he's like, and I decide I'm never making a studio movie ever again. Life's too short. I'm never working with these fuckers ever again. And then the next episode is Universal came back around to me and I thought it's been a little while. I should give it another right. shot. Yeah. <laughs> I should make a movie. Why not? Right. I'll make and you a were movie. like, it's been 18 months. Like he just yeah. feels We've like. We've both grown since then. Right. He flips between this steadfast like I don't care I can walk away life's too short I don't want to do this and being like I don't know I want to see if I could make it work this time well I I think there are some people like a David Lynch or a John Carpenter who have other passions you know David Lynch is a painter and he he made music and all that stuff that he does and and Carpenter is a very talented musician himself and like has other interests loves playing Uh, video games yeah let's play video games basketball there's the the rare um, director who's struggled in Hollywood who um, can walk away without having another passion. Like Albert Brooks. I don't know if you guys have done an Albert Brooks one yet. There's not a ton of movies. but We've like, not, but he did. He just, he he just, news, but we never made it. Yeah. We, we should do he, a Brooks. Anyway. Yeah. He just walked away you know, after yeah. looking for comedy in the Muslim world and he didn't do anything else. He wrote one book and he's like, okay, I'm good. I'm done. See ya. I'm going back to my house in the Palisades, and you're not going to see or hear from me, and unless I do drive or something. That was because he's from a time in showbiz. He he's from a time in showbiz where you got residuals, and yeah. he could sure. just kind of look at like what's going to come in and speculate on that, and and then just go, all right, I'm good. I can walk. But then away. no, but then no ego either. Like there's still the ego, and and I'm sure every single person on this podcast right now has one. I certainly do. And so when you're sitting around at home and you're watching TV or baseball or whatever, and you say, uh, I just saw this commercial for this movie that looks like crap. I could do a better job than that. I should win an Oscar. I'm the, I'm the, the most talented person of all time. That drive, that feeling doesn't just go away. Uh, so I'm not surprised that Carpenter looks at the world of uh, filmmaking and says, I can still do it. But at some point he is able to walk away because he does have other passions. Yeah, I do think it's also just like every movie was a fucking battle for him. And yeah. most of them flopped and were disliked when they came out. And I think he's enjoying his victory lap of how much he is beloved and how much almost every single one of his films has been reclaimed, save for very few at this point in time. Uh, you know, when he does interviews now, he's like, eh, I'm old. I want to stay home. I want to play video games. I don't care. I don't want to make another movie. And then this yeah. thing we keep on coming back to is there was this point where there was a room 
rumor going around that he had pitched a new movie to Blumhouse and then it didn't happen. And he's producer on all the David Gordon Green Halloween movies, which is slightly more than an honorific title, but I don't think he's deeply creatively involved. He's but making like, music for it too. You know, he's, he's making music for them and he sort of has like Godfather status over the things. But you do question like, why aren't they just saying, here's your $10 million? Like, uh, yeah. write a premise that can fit into $10 million or 15 or deal. whatever it is. Right. Yeah. The old deal he had in the 80s. Yeah. Why right. not just let, let, let Carpy work? But he may not want to. He might not want I to. Do, I do imagine that if he wanted to, he could probably make it happen. Yeah. I think he's he's better off than Terry Gilliam. He's way better off than Terry Gilliam, who will, will scramble to make money from 700 European arms dealers and then yeah. make a terrible movie <laughs> right. and then say something about cancel culture that makes everybody hate him again. Like, I would rather what we're getting from Carpenter where he says, this is my filmography, this is my canon, right. I made some really troubling movies at a time when people didn't want to see those, and uh, now I'm, I'm loved. Terry Gilliam could have walked away, but no, I got to make my stupid Don Quixote movie. Hey, that, I like that movie. All right. I'm sure you did. But for the most part, people found it uh, not good. Yeah, the thing about, I didn't even hate the Don Quixote movie. The thing about that movie was like, oh my God, after 20 years, he finally made it. And I watched it and I was like, that was okay. Like, yeah, yeah. That's my okay. exact kind of a stance as well. We've talked, oh. the weirdest thing about that movie is that it's neither a disaster nor a masterpiece. The fact that it's okay somehow is the most disappointing result of all. <laughs> it, like, like, we would have done Gilliam. Obviously, he's a sort of classic blank check guy, right? Yeah. I feel like Griffin, you and I are probably both less interested in doing him these days because he's Correct. become such a pain in the ass. Yes. Uh, and, but it's, also that he like Dave is saying kind of made like this run of 10 fascinating movies and he was like and four more that you know yeah he can't help diminishing himself. returns zero yeah. right. theorem no zero theorem fans in the house nah that nah yeah. that's the thing for yeah. like even if his career ended in 2005 right and you have like Brothers I mean, Grimm like, uh, is Brothers this Grimm, like horrible right. studio filmmaking compromised experience and then Tideland is this passion project that's like fucking demented that would be sort of an right. interesting series and then Parnassus zero Ther theorem and Quixote are all three like no I'm gonna come back and do the kind a movie you loved from me. <laughs> and there's three more at bats where he's like, I got one more Brazil in me. And we keep on going, like, do you? I you don't. <laughs> yeah. You have ra you have you have sold your soul to these sleazy people that you constantly have to sue over right. profits uh, because you can't just say, I'm not gonna make it. Just I won't, it's not the right situation. I'm not gonna make it. And Carpenter, like, to his credit, says, I'm good. <laughs> But I'm good. It, that's the thing. It is simultaneously both depressing and frustrating that there have only been two John Carpenter movies in the 21st century, period. Like, he makes this film in 2001, and he makes The Ward in 2011, and he's done, right? On the other hand, I do think it has been great for his reputation. Yeah. It has frozen yeah. everything yes. he made before the year 2000 in amber, and it makes it makes it so there is not sort of like well, but then of course, obviously, diminishing returns fall off. It's like the diminishing return fall off for him was arguably only five movies after such a stellar run, and of those five, most people have like a soft spot for at least one or two of them. Yeah, it's been great for his legacy. Mm -hmm. But not a lot of directors are thinking about that. They're thinking about how do I get back to Cannes? How do I get that Oscar? How do I get that next big check? How do I get back into magazines? And how do I compete with my peers? Like you have to, yeah. you have to retire at some point. You have to say enough is enough. I think in any profession, but especially in an artistic one where your fastball does get slower every single year. It's true. And that's another thing with him, too, is that, like, I don't think he ever has had that itch of, like, I'd love to fucking finally win an Oscar and be taken seriously. Like, he he seems to be somewhat resentful and, and constantly in interviews, like, throws shade at David Cronenberg kind of selling out by going legitimate. Like, he's like, I don't huh. know why David Cronenberg tries to disown the fact that he was a horror filmmaker. Now he yeah, wants he to make these intellectual movies. It. I think also... he. I read this one fucking, I didn't even read it. It was a video I watched, some interview with him where he talked about that all the horror directors used to have like a regular dinner that they would do a couple yeah, times a year. The Masters and of Horror that, Dinner. 
Right. And then Cronenberg stopped going to them and then he ran into him at some other thing and Cronenberg kind of gave him the brush off. Ooh. And he felt that Cronenberg was kind of like going like, no, I make like Freud movies yeah. now. Yeah, go fuck a car, dude. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but Crony, man, I'm like, he's still doing uh, wild stuff. His the his new movie sounds I but bonkers. Love I can't Cronenberg. Wait. I, yeah. I love Cronenberg. And I I think it's fine that he swerved, that he Me too. You know, pivoted. Yeah, yeah, Me yeah. Me too. And and he's pivoted well. It wasn't just like a, a hollow attempt for, you know, uh, uh, legitimacy or hardware or whatever. But he he did shift. And I think Carpenter doesn't have that shift in him. I think if he were to come back and right. make another movie, his goal would be, I'd like to fucking scare people. Or yeah. I'd like yes. to make something that's just really fun. But this, the shift is what allows you to prolong your career. And yes. I'm sure you guys have seen it a uh, hundred times as you're, you've been doing this podcast that there is a point where there is either a tonal shift or a, an attempt to go to the next level or raise the bar, do something wacky, uh, and or there isn't, you know, or the director yeah. is just like, I'm good. I'm going to keep making the same movie. Dario yes. Argento had, you know, maybe two phases of his career and then circled back to the end, you know, before before the end of his his, his life. But uh most people don't have any shifts and they just are workmen and or work people. Like I think you need to have that desire to continue pushing the envelope and doing new stuff because that's what allows you to evolve and grow as an artist and have a longer career. Also, you know Dario Argento is still alive, right, Dave? I thought he died. No. No, I think Oh Dario Nicolodi is dead. Okay. Dario Argento is still alive. Okay, good for him. I I, I hope he never makes another movie. Uh, because <laughs> he hasn't made a good one in a long time. That is a great full circle point, though, Schilling, because that's what this movie is. This movie is an, ar a, an odd object of a guy who fundamentally refuses to adapt to the times, right? As you said, you cannot make this film at this budget yep. level with this cast two years after The Matrix. You can't do it. And he's just like, why would I do anything differently? I don't care what the fucking kids want, right? And his, his uh, mm -hmm. greatest respect was always for the filmmakers in like the 40s studio system where it's like, I don't know, you just make four movies a year. Like it's a job, it's a job, get the movies done, right? Rather than needing to sort of yeah. evolve and push himself in that way. A lot of it was sort of like traveling showmen, like what will get the people into the tent this week? And I think partly the reaction to this movie, but also like the last four movies leading up to this point being increasingly out of favor. He's just like, they don't want what I'm selling anymore. I don't necessarily want to make something else. It's fine. We can part ways here. A guy you look at who for me is a great example of what I would love to see Carpenter do is uh, Verhoeven, where it's yeah. like he backed away for a while. He felt fucking burnt out on Hollywood, you know, and then he came back really fucking strong. Now, the way he's come back is making, you know, three European art house movies, each spaced about 10 years apart. I just saw the latest one at Beyond Fest. I can't fucking wait. Yeah, yeah. me too. Uh, Benedetta. Yeah. Yes. But I don't know if it, like that felt like he took enough time away that people came back and appreciated him. And then he found yes. a way to evolve a little bit as an artist and do something that's very much in his wheelhouse, but something he could not have made in his younger days. Um but that's how his career started. Like he's going back to square one in a weird way. His big Hollywood films were the sidetrack from that. Absolutely. Whereas Carpenter doesn't have a, a sidetrack. Carpenter always was just making movies like this. You Griffin, know? are you saying yeah. that millennials are killing the John Carpenter industry? <laughs> I think millennials are maybe willing to bring the John Carpenter industry back. I think the two things millennials will pay for are avocado on toast and john carpenter movies i think <laughs> there's just a john carpenter shortage you know you could own a home if you didn't want to have john carpenter keep on making movies you got to go see if you stopped buying these special colorway john carpenter <laughs> soundtrack vinyl releases <laughs> i simply can't i i am addicted another addicted. anthology come on you don't need that on vinyl <laughs> Lost Themes Part 3? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, he's got one He's got one pitch. He's a pitcher with one yeah. pitch, and it's a great pitch, and I love to watch him throw it, but he might not be able to throw it so hard anymore. 
And you're right. If he doesn't want to make another movie, then I'd rather he doesn't than come back and make something. Yeah, then make something tired or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. those kids that made Argento finish his trilogy. Like, no, right. just leave him alone. What if he wants to just smoke cigarettes and drink, uh, you know, rose all day uh, in Italy? Like, leave this man alone. That sounds nice. It's yeah, lovely. let's leave Carpenter alone. And neither of us have seen The Word yet. We yeah. will watch it for next week's episode as we finish this out. But I have not heard a single person ever defend that movie. And that feels like, well, everyone spent nine years after Ghost of Mars going like, John, come on. And then he did this movie and then it wasn't what they wanted it John, to be. John, we were wrong. Right, right. <laughs> it's like, what if what if we like the word? You don't know. Maybe, maybe cool. we love the word. Who's on the show next next week? Well, we're not well, going to reveal that. Well, top secret oh, I didn't realize it was a secret, even though you guys yeah, released right. an entire calendar with all the... I guess you well, didn't people release the guests. We don't release the guests. And the other oh, thing is okay. that we have made the mistake in the past of announcing a guest and then having a major scheduling kerfuffle. That's and then having the oh. reason we right. don't say it. It's happened a couple times. That's I, the I, 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 I wouldn't know what that was like. <laughs> Absolutely not. We have we have Making a guest podcast next week. Is super easy. Yes, go ahead. We have a guest next week. We have yep. a guest next week who is great and is very excited to do it, and I think is a perfect person. And the Carpenter series on, and yes. I find it unlikely that anything will go awry in making you that never episode know, happen. But yes, but you yeah. never know. You never know because uh, M Night Shyamalan's The Happening with James Urbaniak is an episode that fundamentally does not exist, despite yeah. the fact that we <laughs> promised it. We yeah, promise I, I I shouldn't have said a word about Ackroyd on this podcast. Now uh, he's going to be like, <laughs> yeah, uh, he's, he's going to disappear it. like a ghost. That guy's available. You can get him. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, have, we have tried so hard to get him for George Lucas talk show and we can't. Really? Uh, really? I know. Yeah, and and our pitch him. has been, John, John, our pitch has been well, that, Dan. That's where you're fucking up. You can call him <laughs> John. My <laughs> name is not John. Friend. Yeah, his best friend, you fucking idiot. Belushi, listen to me. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, our pitch has been Dan. You come on and talk about whatever the fuck you want for however right. long you want. You're the only ghosts. guest. You said how long it is. We'll talk to you about ghosts and UFOs and whatever you want. The floor is yours. The other pitch is that Connor Ratliff, who plays George Lucas, does not drink, has drank like three times in his entire life. And if he came on the show, we would make the entire thing uh, as an hour plus devoted to solely promoting uh, Crystal Skull Vodka. And we would each drink. So it would be drunk, fake George Lucas talking oh, to man. real Dan Aykroyd about ghosts and aliens. And every time we reach out, they're like, he's not promoting anything right now. Well, he's promoting Ghostbusters right now. That's why I we know. got him. I know. You're damn right. And, 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 and remember, again, it's Crystal Head Vodka. Crystal yeah, Skull. I know. It's the Indian kingdom. Jam. Crystal <laughs> Skull is the other. Yeah. Just try again, guys. I really we'll have again. faith. Yeah. We'll try again. David. It's that time. Uh, what's up? Time to open up a new browser window and see what's currently playing on Mubi. Tap, tap, tap. What do we got? I just watched tap, something. Tap, tap, tap. I just watched two movies on Mubi.com, actually. I'm going to tell you, Griff. I watched two early Denis Villeneuve movies. Ooh. Villeneuve. I watched uh, August 32nd on Earth. And uh, what the heck is it called? The one with the fish. Uh, Maelstrom. Maelstrom. Wow. Weird early Canadian Villeneuve movies. Where were they? movie because movie has all kinds of awesome exceptional films from around the globe i'll say talk about synergy i'm looking right here john carpenter 80s double bill you gotta escape from new york and the fog uh that's absolutely true who doesn't love him look at some of these films of the day to the wonder yep uh jeanette the childhood of joan of arc great movie uh what princess sid that's a great movie that is a great movie. I know I always freak out about that movie when we do a movie. That's ad, a, but it's that's so a pretty good. gosh darn great movie. And to the wonder might not be as great, but it's certainly one of the twirliest movies ever made. Oh, so twirly. That's a fun one. You've got Sean Baker's Starlet. You ever wanted to check that one out? Throw that on your list. Andrew Bajowski's Funny Haha. I'm a big fan of. Oh yeah, that's a great movie. His first film and Beeswax too. Beeswax is great. They got they got several Bajowskis on. Here. Uh yeah, but you know Sean Baker Starlet. I'm just noticing that because he's got a new movie out. Obviously. Yep. You got Edward Yang's The Terrorizers. Ooh, I'm putting that on my watch list. I'm having some fun right now. Uh, movie. Look, every each and every film is hand selected. It's your own personal film festival. It's streaming anywhere, anytime. And Griffin, you can try it for thirty days free at movie.com slash check that's mubi.com slash check for a whole month of great cinema for free 
It's a no-brainer. It is. We love movie. We love movie. We love movies, and we love movie. We sure do. Uh, box office game. I do want to take us through. Yes, the opening weekend of Ghost of Mars, August twenty fourth, two thousand and one. Not, not a, no. a hot time at the box office, and it's opening number nine Ooh. with three million dollars. Horrible. Uh, grossing eight total domestically. Yikes. I I would sort of argue that the two worst box office weekends are the first week of September and the first week of January, but last week of August last is week pretty of August is fucking close. Yeah. And now now Shang-Chi has opened first week of September and made a bazillion dollars, so last week of August might be less desirable than first week of September. What else came out that day though? The, well, uh, I'm going to tell you some of the movies that came out this day there's a lot one of them is in the to top five them. so griffin's gonna guess it but the okay. some of the movies that are opening new that are not in the top five you've got freddie prince jr baseball movie summer summer catch, catch. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you've got sure uh the curse of the jade scorpion woody oh, Allen burning up the box yeah. office opening at number 11 Bad Ooh, movie. you have Ooh. jake gyllenhaal cult comedy bubble boy yeah yes. pretty good opening Zach opening at number 13 yeah. he's great in that movie yeah and then you have um uh, what's uh, the movie is called Tortilla Soup? Isn't it a remake? Am I crazy? Oh, it's yes. a remake of Eat Drink Man Woman. Eat Drink, Drink Man Woman. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, opening at number twenty, but Griffin, number one of the box office is a sequel. It's in its third week at number one. It's a comedy. It's Rush Comedy's Hour Two. Ruling this box office. It's Rush Hour Two. No. What? <laughs> Rush Hour Two is number two. It's American two. Pie Two. It's American Pie Two. Thank the you. The two okay. twos at the top of the box office, crushing. Both of them are crushing American Pie 2 and Rush Hour 2. Uh, back August, stupid comedies ruled the roost. I've said this before, and I got I got the specifics wrong, but Rush Hour 2 at the time of its release was like one of the five highest grossing opening weekends of highest all Highest groping? You might be talking it about the also, director unfortunately, of that movie. It's not about the Jade the Scorpion there. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of high groping movies at the box yeah. office this weekend. I'll tell you uh, this. never see, I've never seen a Rush Hour. They're okay. Never seen never any seen of them. The I have only good. seen... One. I've only yeah. seen the first one. I have never seen it's, two. It's the pastiche is like all the movies that I like, but yeah. it's not the it, it's the sum of the parts is not enough for me to enjoy it. Uh, yeah, I think two and three are bad. I think one is is functional. Is like satisfying. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I remember it being yeah. pretty fun. Seeing you know, the two yeah, of them Jack. together, the chemistry between the two leads carried that movie. Right. Number three at the box office is the other new entry this week. It's also a comedy sequel, but in kind of a different way. Very nerdy movie uh, from someone you've collaborated with, Griffin Newman. Oh, 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 oh. It's Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. You know, it's funny to think about this as the pre-9-11 weekend, practically. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah, American yeah. Pie 2, Rush Hour 2, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. America's just like, this is fine. Yeah. Let's just be stupid. You know, sit around giggling. Uh, Jane Silent Bob Strike Back opening at number three to eleven million dollars. I feel like that was seen as an underperformance, but in retrospect, yeah. I'm like, that's pretty good for like a very niche movie. But comedies were so hot back then. That's they like were, the other had to thing. get hundred million. Yeah. And it was like R-rated raunchy comedy. It had so many stars in it, even if they were mostly cameos. And it comes out after Dogma, and Dogma, despite all the controversy, was like far and away his highest grossing movie. Yeah. So I think people thought that this one might break out a little because they were like, well, it's like a stoner movie. It's like two like sex-obsessed stoners. Isn't that similar to the types of movies that do well? Uh, but right. it's it's an incredibly niche film that is almost entirely made up of fan service and yeah. callbacks to four other fairly niche films. That's what I hated about it so much. And thank God he's doing those again. Yeah. Hey. Masters of the Universe Revelation Part 2 coming out November 2021. He he tried a lot of different stuff, Kevin Smith. He and, did. And I think that's 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 why he's still Red State, floating around. Red State? Yeah. Uh, that's He could have just kind of yeah. clicked into doing stuff like that. Tusk. Steady, steady hand directing Red State. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I, yeah, I don't mind Red State, actually. Yeah, uh, I have not seen it since it came out. Number four at the box office, speaking of Red State, is a horror film. A pretty good one. Uh, uh, it's kind a of a slow film? burn hit. Makes like a hundred million dollars. It's the others. Mm. Oh, good, wow. non-jumpy, super atmospheric. I haven't thought about that in a long time. Good movie. 
Good movie. Good movie. I like yeah. that movie. So there are like um, six movies getting dumped into wide release this one weekend. And and they're all tanking. Because yeah, number five, Griffin, is another madcap comedy with an all-star cast. Rat Race? It's Rat Race. Mm. Wow. <laughs> what? Rat Race. The race Guys. is on. The race, the, on. Cover, the, the race is on. Yeah, Enjoy well. the race. I mean, I, you know, I'm realizing how many movies can be said about that. So Griffin, but I still was blown away by that. Thank you. I, I mean, this is just I remember this weekend vividly. You know, after that, it's like Summer Catch. That's another comedy, right? right? Summer Catch is like a rom com, right? I've never seen it. Um, you've got uh, The Princess Diaries at number seven. That's cleaning up. Sure, but it's <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> uh, number eight, uh, Captain Corelli's Mandolin, a famous bomb of the year, yeah. huge bomb. Uh, base, great, great book, terrible movie. Basically, everyone is miscast. Oh, the tone. why the hell did they release it in the summer too? I guess it's because it's Greek island or whatever. But oof. I think I think that movie was filmed on Oahu. Am I wrong about that? That's uh, that's interesting. I don't know. I wasn't. I wasn't there. You always have a soft spot for movies. You're like, it's like, it was filmed up the street. Well, uh, Bella Babina, two o'clock, and then Ghost of Mars, Planet of the Apes at number 10. The I was going to ask. Wow. Planet of the That's Apes. Crazy. Okay. Mm. Planet of the Apes came out in uh, July, right? Like, it was the, the last weekend? Is, yes. End it, of July. it was the last week of July. So this is like okay, week it was four for it. So it was it's, around it's my dropped, birthday. That's right. Okay. It's dropped pretty fucking hard. You've also got Jurassic Park 3. These are the mm-hmm. other sort of like lingering blockbusters. Uh, and Legally Blonde. Those are the those are the other big boys. Yeah, I have a soft spot for Planet of the Apes. I, I kind of like that movie. Oh. Have you have you rewatched it? I have rewatched it, yes. And Wahlberg is so so poorly cast in yes. that movie, but you've got Helen and Bonham Carter, a truly wild Paul performance Giamatti. from Jamadi. Exactly, Giamatti's like, amazing. Yeah. what's his name? Linguo, Lingo, Lingo, uh, Limbo, Limbo. Limbo. Yes. Right. right. I just love Jamadi doing any sort of like carnival barker or like He's slave uh, owner or like what he yeah. does in Jungle Cruise. I just, I'm a fan. <sighs> he should be the lead character in Jungle Cruise. <laughs> I agree. I wanted more of Jamadi and, and yeah. The Rock in that. Hopefully, sequel. Um, but yeah, so, and you know, it, just to underline this movie massively underperformed. Yeah. Uh, it was given poor reviews. It kind of felt like this weird sort of damp ending to his career. And now people have come around on it. So Carpenter was like, all right, I'll give you a real damp ending. Don't worry. I'll make one more, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's for next. Comes week. around with yeah. a wet towel, threatens yeah. to throw it on top of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Ghost of Mars. I like it too, Griff. I like it. I own the yeah, DVD. It's I'm happy. It's a I six. It, or it's a gentleman's six for me. Yeah. Yeah, it's a six and a half, maybe. I'm going to go five. I mean, it's it's definitely not above average. Jonah, now That's... you have to give a number. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I lost track of the conversation because I was... Because uh, it turns out it wasn't uh, Captain Corelli's Mandolin, and I thought it might have been Tears from the Su- Tears of the Sun by Bruce Wills, and then I was went down a rabbit Was it Talkers? Hole. Wind Talkers, that was it. Wind Thank Talkers, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yes. Lots of war movies. I was going to say right it was a Tiger time, Land. I had a lot of options lined up. So it, it but it was talkers. the other sort of prestige uh Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage attempt. World yeah. War right. II movie. Yes. Historical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that because that came out in 2002. So, yeah. Yes. yes. All right. That's he should not going. have made back to back World War II movies. That was a mistake. There's a lot of things Nick Cage should and shouldn't have They done. were hot, though. That's World true. War II movies were hot as they hell. Back Saving Private Ryan, yeah, it's true. It was History John Channel. Madden and John Woo. It's true. Yeah, they, they were prestige projects. It's true. Yeah. I can't deny it. And Captain Corelli's Mandolin is a great book, I will say. Um, but he's he's such insane casting for that role when you read the book. It's crazy. We don't need to talk about Captain Corelli's Mandolin. We do need to <laughs> send our guests on their way because they have a hard out. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we did have a hard out 10 minutes ago. Exactly. Whoopsie. Jiminy so, Christmas. Sorry. Uh, I'll, I just, I, I, again, don't really know what was happening, but I'll say uh, five. Yeah, there you go. Good. Okay, Nailed great. It. Yes. All right. Great. Nailed That's it. a good one. That's uh, a good, perfect. Jonah, Dave, thank you guys so much for being here. Obviously, people should listen to Galaxy Brains, uh, where a podcasts are found. Is there anything else the two of you want to plug? Absolutely not. Uh, Jonah has has a thing at the, uh, oh, it's probably gone by the time this airs, right? Uh, I don't know. The, what, the men at work screening? screening? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I know that's just a local thing. I don't like that. Uh, but uh, okay. uh, this uh, this uh, January uh, new season of Mystery Science Theater three thousand coming out. It's going to be uh, independently produced thanks to a Kickstarter. It's going to be out on our own uh, website. Uh, but uh, really funny movies, and there's going to be like a new movie on the site 
every month on uh, new riffs, new all the bots are there, stuff like that. So stay tuned for that. Very, very exciting. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys so much for doing this. Thanks for having us. Thank- yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Tick for yeah. tack. Thank you for taking the uh, the midnight train to Mars with us. And thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media, uh, AJ McKeon and Alex Barron for our editing, JJ Birch, Nick Loriano for our research, mm-hmm. Joe Bowen, Pat Rounds for our artwork, Leigh Montgomery, and the Great American Novel for our theme song. You can listen to their new album, Extremely Loud, Incredibly Online, wherever. You find albums. I don't know. Uh, go to blankies.riot.com for some real nerdy shit. And go to patreon.com slash blank check for blank check special features where we do franchises on commentaries. And, of course, obviously, are ending out the year with Tim Allen's Santa Claus trilogy. Amazing. Um, tune in next week for the, the end of Carpenter. It's been it's yep. been a wild run. Duh, Ward. Duh, Ward. <laughs> And as always, I think Ghost of Mars was meant to be the third St. Kliskin movie. Is that right, David? Damn it. But with Rowdy Roddy instead of <laughs> Russell as the role in the role of Snake Kliskin, right? Is that it was right? It's going to be a gender flipped uh, snake, actually.